Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course series, where I think it's safe to say we all love watching animated cartoons and we probably all love watching them on Nickelodeon. Well, today we're going to learn about how animation is made. We get to see a real live Nickelodeon. It is actually a thing and not just a TV station. And you guys will have an opportunity to make your own animation with our experts from Liberty Science Center. We've got Rosa and Alejandro here to talk us through how animation is made and guide us through making some of our own. Now, a few things, this is designed to be really interactive. So you'll see the chat box to the right of the screen. Please use that to answer their questions because they will be asking you some questions and to ask them questions. And in about 35, 40 minutes, I'm gonna interview them with your questions to get as many answers as we can. So don't wait until the end, ask questions whenever you have them. You'll also see on your screen, there's a link to the Pisco app. That's what Rose is gonna be walking us through as we make our own animations. You may wanna have that clicked and ready to go so you can start doing that. And make sure you've got a camera nearby. In about 35 minutes, we're going to give everybody a chance to lean into the screen, take a selfie with a real live Nickelodeon, maybe not live, but a real Nickelodeon, as we've learned what that means. And if you upload that to Instagram, tag Liberty Science Center and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a spot in a virtual summer camp. We've even got a young animators camp with your name on it. So have a camera nearby, keep it interactive, get that Pisco app up and ready to go so you can become an animator today. And with all that said, I wanna turn it over to your teachers from today from Liberty Science Center in New Jersey, Rosa and Alejandro. Alejandro, you're up. All right, hello everyone. It's exciting to be back with Varsity Tutors once again. So as you can see, I'm actually inside one of our exhibits. It's actually one of our traveling exhibits. So I'm gonna step aside real quick. So you can see, and you already have an idea of what you registered for, but these are actual illustrations and sketches by a world famous author and illustrator named Mo Willems. All right, you may be familiar with that name, but you may be familiar with Mo's famous character, which is the pigeon. All right, so you may know stories about the pigeon takes the bus. You know that the pigeon tends to be a very stubborn character, but this exhibition not only talks about that world famous character, but we talk about the art behind the story. So what Miss Rose and I are going to take you through is a little bit of a history of animation. So Ms. Rosa, before we get to her, I do want to show you some artifacts all around the room, right? So as you can see right here in the back, as I mentioned before, we have some illustration, but as you can see right down here, all right, where it says potty, all right? So we have a character that is an example of what we call cell animation. So think of it as like a sandwich where you have your bottom bread and then you add in your favorite, uh, your favorite food, could be turkey, you put on lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise, and then you top it all off with the other half of that sandwich. So when we talk about cell animation, we're talking about having one background as the first layer, and the only thing that changes is a clear plastic cell that has our characters, and they just move it, take a photo, move the next one, take a photo. But it took a while before we got to that point in animation. So as Mr. Brian mentioned, I got some artifact, other artifacts to show you in terms of filmmaking and animation. All right, so we're gonna go over to our first artifact. So before I talk a little bit more about it, let's see if anyone in the audience knows what this artifact is. So let's see what we got. Let's see, any good guesses, any good guesses? Oh, I see someone got it. So this is what we call a zoetrope. So this is a pretty neat contraption where you notice that, that I have a wide variety of singular little illustrations. So this one is one of the monsters that Mo created. And if you notice, it's kind of angled down where a mirror can pick it up, all right? So a zoetrope was actually first created in the 1800s. And interestingly enough, we had giant movie theaters that had giant versions of these machines, and they had a whole bunch of small little clips like this. And depending on how fast you spin it, you can see the animation go into action. All right, so you can actually see that the really cool thing about the Sovetrope is that it is uh, two directions. You can go in reverse, you can go forward, 
And depending on how fast you want to see the animation, I can actually go crazy and spin it real quick. You can see it a little bit more fluid. It's a little bit of a blur, but it all depends on the right amount of turn. They get a nice, brief, cool animation. All right. So we talk about the iterative process at Liberty Science Center. So we talk about we have one design, but we want to improve upon it. So when we look at animation and filmmaking starting at the 1800s, all right, we looked at even more artifacts. These things started to evolve, and we end up, as Mr. Brian mentioned, the Nickelodeon. So this is a, an improvement on the Zoetrope. So you can see it kind of looks like a TV screen, all right? And instead of having all of the different uh, slides in a circle, what we have instead is you notice we have little gears on the side and each square is one little screenshot of that drawing. So if I move it slowly, there's the next image. And if I keep going, there's the next one, there's the next one. And if I just go in a more fluid motion, and if I go a little bit quicker, you can see the animation. The really cool thing about the Nickelodeon, the way that it got the name Nickelodeon, is because these little machines, you would go to a theater, and they typically have a larger one, but there's a gallery of little smaller booths that have a singular uh, singular little clip, and it cost five cents to play that animation. It could be a drawing, or it can be a whole collection of pictures. And the really cool thing, about our Nickelodeon, notice how I'm spinning the other way, and the pictures do not move in that direction. So the machine is designed to kind of go in one singular direction to see that full product. So obviously we're gonna jump ahead a couple of hundred years, all right? And we're gonna go to Ms. Rosa because, you know, as I mentioned, the iterative process, now that we have more technology, and you are pretty much familiar with a lot of animated movies that are going on in terms of computer animation. If you're a gamer, you got pixel art. So what we're going to do today is Ms. Rose is going to show us exactly how to use pixel art to make a very small animation that we saw here at the exhibit. So take it away, Ms. Rosa. Thank you, Mr. Alejandro. Hi, everyone. It's been a while. I hope you remember me. I'm so happy to be with you today, and I'm going to talk to you about that digital animation part. So what you're seeing right now on the screen is um, a little bit of just a background, just to understand what is involved with any type of drawing. There are things that we do need to consider in order to be sure that things are flowing and looking and feeling well, because in fact, a picture, as they say, can actually give you a whole bunch of different sensations. And it's because of what you put into it. So let's start. So one of the things that we're gonna see here is that there are two different ways. So Mr. Alejandro pointed out that we are actually going to be using pixel art. Well, there are different types of digital images. If you are a gamer using, you know, playing games that are created nowadays, um, then you are probably using something more like vectors. And vector is this really smooth image. And it is actually made up of lots of geometric shapes, more like triangles or um, different polygons is what we actually say. So different polygons and the more polygons you use, the smoother, the more details you can have. But when games first started, you really didn't have the sophistication. It was very basic. And so we, uh, you actually still see it used in newspaper print. Um, they use lots of dots to make up images. And instead of dots in a, in a pixel world, we use squares. So this is what we call our bitmaps. So pixels are little tiny squares, just like your computer screen, just like your television screen, just like your cell phone. They're different, um, they're small, or depending on the resolution, they could be, have lots of different pixels, but they all have a color to them. Now, the pixels that we're gonna do today are actually very simple. 
So something like this heart is where we're shooting. That's our goal. But in order to get to this heart, um, we need to realize that we're not so worried about those super fine details, right? If we stand far away, we'll be able to tell what that object is. When we look closer, we'll be able to see all those individual pixels or all those individual squares that make up a color. The more complex, uh, the larger the screen, the more pixels you have and the finer the pictures will look. But you know that is what pixel art is. So give me some examples that you've seen in terms of quality of image that use pixel art. Oh, we're getting back to those games. Oh, and I see, yes, Minecraft. Believe it or not, Minecraft is absolutely pixel art. So those little squares, even though they are blocks, those blocks are made up of different color squares. And those squares are used in, in a, a kind of like an assortment of colors to give you the bricks and the different types of, um, the different types of uh, objects that you can have and objects you can build. So Minecraft is a great example. I see Super Mario's, I see some other really cool games. Excellent. So now you get it. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about um, another component before we get into the artwork. And that component is the colors. So when comics and even um, uh, we have animated pictures started to, to expand the world, there were a lot of basic colors. And, they're called primary colors. And you know, if we think about Superman or Spider-Man, they have a very clear color pattern to them. And that's because at that time, it was very easy to print out um, those type of images using primary colors. So I know that the color wheel here gives you a little bit of clues, but you can also put in, if you know the primary colors, that we are going to spot on the screen. You can spot them on the screen, you can write them in. Excellent. We have our red, blue, and yellow. Now, another part of it is that if you mix these red, blues, and yellow, you actually get those really cool intermediate colors, right? So those intermediate colors are the mixing of these primary colors to get the new combination. And then we can also go a little further, what we call secondary colors, we can go further and go complementary. And these are colors that, um, that really suit each other, right? That you want to kind of have because they, they really are very dramatic. But colors, combination, where they're located, how you put them together can also tell you a lot about your character. For example, if your character has a lot of dark colors or even red coloring, we can take it to Star Wars. You know, why does Darth Vader have a red saber and Obi-Wan has a blue saber? Well, that's because red is kind of going to the dark side. Red is very energetic. Red could be a lot of energy, whereas blue is more of a cool, calm color. So, by thinking about color combinations, you can actually come up with a really great story behind your character without using any words. So why don't we um, get one more point across and then we'll go to the drawing. So in order to make a drawing that's very flat pop and appear 3D, we have to use a little bit of physics. So we have to think about how the light is going to work on our character, where, which direction is it coming from? So I'm going to ask you this question. So if the light is coming at me from this direction, um, what is created because my body blocks that light from continuing? What do we call that item that is created due to the light being blocked by a solid object. Hmm. You probably saw it today that it was really sunny and there were trees out in your walk and you saw this long, dark, oh, yes, shadows. So shadows are important to think about. So shadows give this illusion of depth. 
and kind of 3D. So we see here, it's important to kind of think about those aspects. Um, we're going to add a little bit of tone, but why don't we get to it? Let's get to it. So now you are going to be working in your Pixel app, but I want you to remember, uh, I want you to start off with me and stay in the classroom for a little bit. I'm going to tell you to go off and do some artwork, but I want to introduce you to the application. So stay with me in the classroom, okay? So here we are in the Pixel app. Now, what you have on this side, on the left-hand side, are all the tools. And you're going to see that the main tool that's highlighted immediately is the pen tool. So the pen tool has different sizes to it. So if you look above the pen tool, you'll see these small pixels. So I'm gonna tell you in a moment to go ahead and try you can just click onto the canvas. The canvas is the, the checkerboard that's light gray and dark gray. And I want you to change the size of the pen tool by clicking on the little squares above. Go ahead, take a moment to do that and play around with that. You can make different arrangements, you can make different things happen, go with the smallest size, go with the biggest size, little abstract art there. I'll give you one, another about 20 seconds to play. All right, so come on back to the classroom. If you're already here, great. We're gonna move on to the next step before we start our, our animation and our drawings. So the next thing I want you to do is well, we have this beautiful abstract artwork, right? But I wanna erase it. So let me introduce you to the eraser tool. Um, so the eraser tool is actually two, it's on the, the first column, third row. And it too can use the same size pixel, the larger size pixel to make the eraser larger or smaller. So go ahead and clean up your canvas. Go ahead and click on the eraser, click on the largest size, and go ahead and clean up your canvas. When you're using it, you wanna click on it and keep it clicked down so that it's activated the whole time. So go ahead and do that. If you are working with your classroom and the Pixel app kind of like shared screen side by side, awesome job. If not, don't worry, we'll go back and forth. Okay, so hopefully, You've had enough time to clean your canvas because what we're going to do is I'm going to have you come back to the classroom and I'm going to introduce you to a couple of, of additional tools. And actually with these tools, we're going to either you can follow along with me or you can start to kind of create your own. Um, I'm going to give you the tools that we're going to use so that we can kind of do this together. So one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to just simply draw a ball and give it a little bit of the physics with the light so that we can understand and make that ball pop. The way we're going to do this is we're going to, and I want you to stay with me first before you go off on your own. The way we're going to do this is I'm going to use this first column, second roll. It's a paint bucket. This way I can splash color onto my canvas. Um, so let me do it first. In order to change the color for your canvas, we do have all the way at the bottom of all your tools, we have two squares that are kind of sitting on top of each other. Those are your color palettes. You can click on the square and you can actually move this little white circle around until you get to the, to the saturation how deep and true you want that color to be. Or you can use the rectangle, the white rectangle to select the color that you wish to start off on. Now thinking about my color wheel, I am going to go with uh, maybe uh, blue and maybe orange. So I'm gonna start with blue. I'm gonna get my paint bucket and I'm gonna dump the paint in there. I do want to introduce you to one more thing because it's going to make our lives a lot easier. So the one I want to introduce you to is 
this plus button here called layers. So this plus button will add, remember Mr. Alejandro said a cell. That's what we're using here. A layer is kind of like a clear pane of glass um, that goes over top of your image. And we're gonna stack these so that we can work comfortably. So I'm gonna click on that plus and it's going to kind of put that layer on top and make my background a little less bright. So go ahead and you do that. I'm gonna give you a, about a minute or so to add, a, choose a color, get the paint bucket, dump that paint all over that background, add a layer. Now, if you need any additional help, I'll, don't worry, I'll repeat those steps in the classroom. So you're going to choose a color by clicking on the square all the way to the bottom, place the little white circle onto the, the, how deep and rich you want that color to be. You can change the color with the rectangle and move it up and down. Once you have it selected, you're going to click on the paint block bucket and dump that onto your canvas. Imagine doing that in real life. It's fun, but quite, quite messy. Parents may not like it, but that's okay. All right, now that you have your paint splashed on your canvas, we're gonna use a new cell. We're gonna put a layer on top. So all the way to the right side, you're going to see the word layers. And you're going to go to that plus, and you're going to click on that plus. And what that's going to do is going to make the, the background that you just dumped all that paint on, it's gonna make it checkerboard and a little less bright. So when you're done, come back to the classroom. We'll go on the next steps. So now you can actually, if you're working on a computer with a mouse, you can actually um, toggle between two different colors. That's why there's two squares. So you can choose two different colors and work with them. Um, I'm just gonna click on the one square. I'm just gonna click on the one square and make sure. So just remember that um, the link to Pixel app is in the classroom page. Okay, so if you want to work with me on this and you just arrived, welcome, welcome, welcome. Go to the classroom page, click on the Pixel Link app, and it'll take you straight away to create this right here. And you can join us at any moment. We'll do a couple of artworks. Okay, brilliant. So now that we have this layer, what we're going to do is we're going to simply we're gonna simply make a, um, make a ball. We're gonna make a ball. So I'm gonna introduce you to the tool that's gonna to help us make the ball. And this is going to be on the second column, one, two, three, fourth row. So you'll, it'll say actually circle tool. So go ahead and click on it. Now, sometimes a, a dark outline is important. Sometimes it's not always needed to be dark, but an outline is definitely helpful. Uh, so I'm gonna go with a black outline. So I have my circle tool selected. I'm going to go to my color palette, which is the square all the way to the bottom of all my tools. And I'm going to move my little circle down to the black and I'm going to make a circle. Now I can make that circle anywhere. Oh, and make sure I just saw my circle is going to be humongous. Make sure you're on the smallest pixel. There we go. So I'm gonna make a circle and it could be anywhere, but try to keep it somewhere center, low bottom center. And all you have to do is click and drag until it gets to the size that you need it to be. So this is the benefit of working with a layer. If you make a mistake, you can just erase it on here and you don't have to worry about your background. So now that I have a circle, 
I need to think about my color combination that's going to work with the blue background. So in this case, I'm going to go with orange. So I'm going to go with my paint bucket. I'm going to click on my paint bucket. I'm going to go to my color palette, which is all the way to the bottom, which is the square. And I'm going to choose a color that is that will work or complement the blue. And I think I'm going to go with orange. I think that'll do. So once I have my the right color combination, I don't think it's orangey enough. There we go. I'm going to make sure that my paint bucket is selected and I'm going to dump it inside of the circle of the outline. If you dump it on the outside, well, you'll get everything else colored except for your ball. So you want to make sure that your circle is a complete circle. There are no openings and that you're putting the paint inside. So there we go. So it looks pretty good. It pops. You can see you want to know how it kind of looks. You look at the top right side of your screen and it will show you your image. So as you're working, it's always important to check back. Is it looking OK? All right. Now, we're saying we're going to make this lifelike. So I'll give you a moment to switch and go to your Pixel app and try something like this or something similar, and then come back to the classroom. If you just joined us, remember that the link to the Pixel app is in the classroom page. All right. So I'll give you a moment. I know color selection is always takes, takes a bit of time, um, but you can work with the orange and blues. There's lots of movie posters also that use these type of colors. Uh, so let's go, let's go into the physics. So the light. So I'm going to just change my tool. So come back to the classroom for just a moment, just a moment, come back to the classroom. And what we're going to do is I'm going to have this light shine on the ball. So you don't do this, but I'm just going to put a, a light on it just to show you what I mean. So if my light is coming from this direction, it's going to hit the top of this area here. So this area should be lighter and this area that's being blocked by the object is going to be darker. So all I want to do is I want to go back to my orange and then go a little darker, change that little circle around. Here's a quick trick on how to do that. At, in the first column, last, uh, last row, you'll see a little color picker, almost like an eyedropper. If you click on it and click on the orange color or whatever color you used for your ball, it'll actually instantly change your color palette. So now if I wanna make it darker, I'm just gonna move that little white circle lower to the ground, or I'm gonna move it closer to the white corner. So I'm gonna make this lighter because that's where my light is hitting. I'm gonna use my pencil tool and I'm just gonna click around until it looks somewhat believable. Not too much. Hey, that doesn't look too bad. I like it there. And the opposite is going to be dark. So I'm gonna go back to my color picker, change that little circle to go a little lower so it could be dark, go to my pencil tool and make it a little darker. Don't go too far. So that's making it spherical. So go ahead and take a moment to do that. So remember the light, you have to think about the direction that the light is coming into and hitting the object. And an object is going to, um, if the object is a solid object uh, that's opaque and not transparent, then the light is going to be blocked and it's going to create a lighter zone. And then on the opposite side, it's going to create a darker zone. So we wanna keep that in mind. All right, come back to the classroom and we'll finish this and uh, this little image 
and then we'll create our animation really fast with all of these tools that we just learned to use. Okay, so my shadow, shadows usually have a very uniform color. They're kind of gray or go to, uh, or go to black. So I'm gonna use that traditional arrangement. So I'm gonna go there and I'm just going to slowly add pixels and I'm gonna look at my picture to see if it's believable. I'm gonna slowly add these pixels. And I think that is about right. So if I click on that, so there's a little image that kind of pops it out or makes it full. You can click on that, which is on the top right corner. You'll see these three little boxes that kind of show you how to pull the image out a little bit. And there it is. Look at that, not too shabby. You probably did something amazing like you normally do. So if you did, give yourself an applause. So now you know how to make the still picture. Still picture with layers. So this is representative of what was standing behind or what was positioned behind Mr. Alejandro. But how about that zoetrope? Well, that's what we're gonna do next. And I think we're gonna go with um, the bouncing ball. We already have a ball shape. Well, no, 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 I'm gonna challenge you. I'm gonna challenge you. So open up a new pixel app. Go ahead and open up a new pixel app. You can go ahead and, and, and click on that link and it'll take you to a new pixel app. I'll give you a minute or two. Don't worry, don't close out of that other one. I'll show you how to save this in a moment. And we are going to keep our work open and then I'll show you how to save it. All right, so we're gonna make an animation and we're gonna use the same steps that we started with for our previous one. So what we're going to need to do is we're gonna need to paint our background. We're gonna do an additional. So go ahead and you can use the same colors you used before. So I'm going to go with a, you know what? I'm gonna go with an, an orange background. That's good. And I'm gonna dump, this is a pretty um, warm color. It's very excitable. Um, that's how I'm feeling right now. So that's what we're gonna use. And I'm gonna introduce a new tool. So once you have your color selected, uh, go ahead and dump that color with your paint bucket as the background. We're gonna do one more thing for our background before we add a new layer. And what we're going to do for that is we're actually going to use uh, a, a tool that's in the second column, third row and it's called a stroke tool. It actually helps us make a straight line because it's really hard to make straight lines if you're using a touch pad or touch screen. So we're gonna click on the, the tool, but we're gonna choose a, a maybe black as our color. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna layer this at the bottom third of our canvas. So think about a piece of paper when you fold it into threes the bottom third. So that would roughly be around here. And you see, I can make it all wiggly, but it'll match it up right here. Okay, now that we divided that, I'm actually gonna change the color on the bottom of my canvas. I'm gonna select a paint bucket and I'm going to go with a different color. Let's see. I think I'm going to go with like a blue. That'll be calming. Yeah, that works. So it's kind of the same color arrangement I used before, but it's a little bit opposite. So you should have a canvas where you dumped one color paint. You use the stroke tool to make a straight line on the bottom third of your canvas. And then you take your paint bucket again, but choose a different color for the bottom third. And this is going to give us the illusion of almost like a wall meeting a floor. 
That's what we're creating here, a wall meeting a floor. Kind of starts with that illusion. When you have that done, remember, we use the plus button all the way over to the right hand side where it says layers. And now we're going to add a layer. So everything behind, it's like what Mr. Alejandro said, everything behind, there's a new clear plate or glass, and we're gonna to start to draw on that. And that's where we're gonna put our moving ball. So we're gonna start the ball at the top and it's gonna make its way to the bottom. I know I said we we're gonna challenge, but we're actually gonna just take it slow. We're gonna pick it slow for a moment. And once you know how to do a ball, you can do anything actually. So now that you have that, and I'll repeat it one more time. I started off with a canvas. I added one color. I drew a straight line. I added a second color. I went to my layers. I added a layer. And now we are at the point. So um, for those of you who need, you can come to the classroom and watch and then do, or for those of you who are, are feeling really comfortable with it, you can listen to my directions and you can go ahead and just stay on the pixel. All right, so we're gonna go and take the circle tool because that's gonna make the sphere that we're going to need. And we're gonna draw that sphere at the top of the wall. It doesn't have to be at the very tippy top, we just wanna see it at the top of the wall. And I'm gonna start with a black outline and then color my sphere. So I'm gonna start over here. I'm gonna drag until I get a nice sphere. About there. When you get a nice sphere or a circular shape, I should say, because it isn't three dimensional yet, I want you to fill that circle with a color. I think for this one, I'm going to go um, with maybe a purple. I'm gonna try for a purple, very light purple. So remember, you fill inside of the outline, like coloring inside the lines. So once you have that, now we're gonna create an animation. So for this, we actually need everyone to come to the classroom because this is a new, area that I haven't shown you yet. And it's very important for animations. So animations typically have 24 frames, but you saw Mr. Alejandro use that zoetrope and that had 10 or less frames, 10 or less pictures. And so typically 12 is okay. 12 is a pretty nice animation. 24 is, is great. 60 is the best. After 60, you, yeah, unless you have a really fancy computer, you're, you're not gonna be able to tell very much. So I'm going to see how the frame is in yellow and there's a little, like two pieces of paper on the bottom right corner, that's copy. So I'm gonna click on that. And now I have my second cell, my second frame. If you were an animator, you're going to draw your picture, and then your second picture is going to be slightly different than your first. So in order to make it slightly different, let me introduce you to a new tool, the hand tool. So in the first, in the first column, in row one, two, three, four, five, you'll see a hand tool. That's to move an object. I'm going to click on that and I'm going to take the, put my moving object, the hand tool onto the circle and move it down once or maybe twice. And over to the right, you will see the picture start to flicker. So go ahead and try that. Some of you may be all into this right now. And that is super cool. This is meant for you to enjoy. You can certainly have fun with all the tools. It's at your fingertips, at your disposal. 
All you need is imagination. Okay, so my goal is to make 12 slightly different pictures doing the same thing I just did. I take the hand, I place it over the, my object, and I move that object down. I take a, make a copy, put my hand over that object, move it down slightly. I do that 12 times. By hand, traditionally, um, animators uh, used to draw each of these pictures by hand, all those details. Pretty cool. All right, so if you want to see how to do it one more time, come back to the classroom and I'll show you. All right, so I'm going to first make a copy or duplicate my frame. That's my third one. I make sure that it's on the third frame. I highlight my hand, which is in the first column, fourth row, place my hand onto the ball, press down and move it slightly. I do this action over and over again. I'll do it one more time. I go to my frame, I press duplicate, I go, I make sure that I'm on the next frame and I add my, I select my tool, move my hand over the object and move it slightly down. So go ahead and do this a total of 12 times. So we have 12 frames in a second. So I'm gonna do it on my own here so that you see the end product. So I'm gonna duplicate it. Now, if I wanted to add more physics to this, um, I could think about how objects react when they meet another object, when they crash into each other, what happens to that energy? Well, if you wanna answer this and take some time away from your animation, you can put the answer in the chat um, and share what happens when a ball makes contact with the floor? What do you think happens? I'll give you time because I know you're busy working on your animations and you're like, Miss Rosa, you're asking us a question while we're in our creative mode. I know, I apologize for interrupting your creative juices and they're flowing. But it is such an important question to think about the physics involved in things. Oh, and now my ball has finally met the ground. So I'm going to, oh, let me, let me actually pay attention to the chat too. Oh, some great answers. And we have it, squishing. You get a squish. Some of that energy continues down to the ground. The object, if it's elastic, if it's flexible, it's going to squish out. It's going to stretch a little. And then the floor is going to give that energy back and the ball is going to bounce, maybe not as high as it did originally, but it has a squish factor. So I want to think about that squish. Great answer. So now that I am here, I'm going to start changing. I'm going to change my picture. I'm gonna use my eraser tool to start creating this squish. So it went, it's making contact. I'm gonna copy it one more time and I'm gonna move it down. And I think at this point, this is my squishing zone because when it squishes, it gets wider, it gets a little wider. So I'm gonna go and change my color and squish it out a little bit. It's hard to see, but don't worry. We're going to duplicate that so that you can see it a little bit better. And I'm going to move it down. I'm almost up to my 12th frame. Oh, my goodness. I got to come back. I might have more than 12. 
that's okay. I'm gonna erase this. I'm gonna make my squish a little bit more exaggerated. Some cartoons are really exaggerated. I kind of find that funny. I'm gonna create a little bit more of a squish. There we go. And then we have to do the reverse, <laughs> right? We have to do the reverse. We'll bring it back up. So I'm gonna start bringing it back up. So to bring it back up, I can simply take my hand and move it back up and then start reconstructing the shape. Or I can do a little cheat. Come back to the classroom and I'll show you my cheat. So my cheat is I go to a film that's about the same look and I duplicate that. I just have to remember to put it in the right order. I have to remember to put it in the right order. Oh, now it's starting to come back up. Okay, that's good. And I'm gonna duplicate this one and I'm gonna put it in the same order. I'm gonna have about 24 by the end of this. That's a good bounce back. This is actually wrong. The only problem with this is that if you get one wrong, you got to figure out where it is. There we go. There we go. Now we're going to come back. I duplicated eight. I'm going to duplicate seven, bring it all the way down. So that's a, that's a quick way of doing it. Duplicate six and start to take that duplicated cell and move it down. It's going back up or you can redraw it. You can absolutely redraw it. Duplicate five. Bring it back down. We're seeing it. Duplicate four. Bring it back down. And there it is. So I'm going to stop at 16. I can definitely go to 24. That shouldn't be a problem. But I'm going to stop at 16. And there we go. Bouncing ball. It doesn't have to be a bouncing ball. I'll show you some, some of the ones that I made. It could be, where is it? It could be a little bottle. Maybe it's a, maybe you're inspired by the Minecraft potions. You can certainly make an animation of a little bottle. Now, how do you save it? So this is how we save it. This is how we save it. We are going to let me go back to, I lost my way over here. Okay, there we go. So we're going to go all the way over to the right-hand side of the screen. And this is something of the 80s and early 90s. We have a floppy disk. <laughs> so this is very, very retro. So there's a floppy disk. And this disk uh, looks like it has a little corner of it. Um, kind of like sliced off, but it is the third image. And this is the saving component. So you can save it uh, by downloading it. Okay, you can, you, can, you can go to the little mountain, you can save it, you can go to the little mountain and you can download it. So there's two ways, you can save it on the floppy disk, or you can go to the mountain and moon, that symbol of the mountain and moon, and you can actually download it onto your computer or onto your device. If it's an animation, you're gonna go with a GIF or a GIF. And if it's a picture, you're gonna go with a PNG. And so a PNG is essentially a picture without the background. Um, it makes it transparent and you can use it and it keeps the size of the picture. So you can make it large and it won't make the picture blurry. So we have a GIF, if it's an animation, if it's a still picture, like the first um, ball that we made, then it's a PNG and you wanna download. So I'm gonna leave my little mouse here so that that way you know where to look for it. It's right in this area. And I would just click download. Make sure that the scale is the highest. So 
so that it can be as large as possible. There's so much you can do with this. You can, you can change the size of your canvas. You can use so many tools. We haven't even touched upon a lot of the other tools, but I encourage you to have fun and play because that's how you learn. You learn through play. And so there's so many things you can do. So just to remind you, again, 12 frames is okay. 24 frames is ideal. You want to go to the little floppy disk and save it. It'll save it locally onto your computer, or you can download it. And that'll be the mountain and moon. And you can, when you download it as in the mountain and moon icon, you can download it as a GIF or a GIF, or you can download it as an image, a PNC, a PNG, sorry. All right, so my young animators, I think we are set. Back to you, Brian. All right, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody. We've had a whole lot of people talking about what it is that they animated or, uh, or that they drew. And uh, so that leads me to one of the main questions. So this is the portion uh, we mentioned. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of q and I'm gonna ask uh, Alejandra and, and uh, Rosa some of your questions, get you guys some answers. We are also gonna take a selfie. So get that camera ready. But a lot of people have been talking about what it is that they drew and uh, you know being pretty excited about that. So we're gonna do this contest in two ways. One, in just a second, we're gonna head back down to the exhibit and you guys can take a selfie with that Nickelodeon. We'll talk a little bit on, you guys had some, uh, some questions there. But two, if you save your project and wanna share that on, uh, on Instagram is instead, uh, we'd love to see that. Or maybe you can do both and uh, you'll also be entered to win that spot in a virtual summer camp. If you enjoy this, we've got a whole young animator summer camp with all kinds of animation and art activities that you would really enjoy. So with all that said, um, keep your questions coming on in, but uh, Alejandro, we may go live to uh, to your spotlight to, uh, to your area here in just a second. If you can queue up the Nickelodeon, we'll give everybody a chance Absolutely. to take those pictures so they can get them online. All right, so here we go. So I figured I'd set up our plucky character, the pigeon, posing for this photo. So go ahead, I'll give you like a five second head start to get that camera ready. Line yourselves up. You can do like a back to back with the pigeon. And on a count of three, we'll take the photo. We'll say cheese. One, two, three, cheese. Awesome, awesome. Can't wait to see those poses. All right. Perfect. And reminder, everyone, if you put that up on Instagram, you'll be entered to win and tag Varsity Tutors and Liberty Science Center. You'll be entered to win a spot in Young Animator Summer Camp or the Summer Camp of your choice. You can also post your uh, your project either in video or image form. And uh, not only, I was going to say, we'll accept that. We'll enjoy that. So yeah, we can't <laughs> wait to uh, to see what we had. A couple other logistical questions while you guys keep your others coming in. Uh, a lot of people were asking, will this be available later if we want to come back? We've been working on our project, come back to you know see some of the history that Alejandro talked about or, or get some of Rosa's tips. Yes, it will. You can come right back to this exact same classroom page link. And in about an hour after class, you'll get an email with that link for safekeeping as well. So um, we'll have that. A lot of questions came in since we just uh, took a picture with the Nickelodeon. A uh, couple questions people had on that. Maybe that's your territory, Alejandro. Um, one, did Nickelodeons have sound accompanying them? And two, how in the world did they get all those pictures? We saw Rosa show us how we can duplicate with computers. How did they get all the pictures to put in there to make those things work? Good question. So about the question on sound. So when these machines first started coming out, especially the, the little blues that you saw and now, and like now we're talking about like big giant movie houses, they did not have sound whatsoever. They were called silent films. So it wasn't until um, during the industrial revolution age where they started advancing technology and one of the famous ones was actually Thomas Edison's film uh, of the great chain rob the train robbers. That was what that was right before what we call the talkies when movies had sound. 
So right, right in that little sweet spot, they discover that they can sync up record uh, recordings of records, run it on a record player, play it at the same time as the film, and that's how you got your sound. Uh, and what was the second question, Brian? I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. We ask a lot of, they've been coming in rapid fire, just like the images yeah, yeah. on the Nickelodeons or all of these people are asking, where did all those images come from? How That's long right. did it take? And how did they get them to, to make sure they knew they were lining up to be sort of continuous video? Very good question. So when we started seeing the Nickelodeons, it was also the advent of the film camera. So think of, uh, you know, just a giant machine. It was actually like a big rectangular box and they had the same print. And all they did was, uh, it took really quick flashes of photos. And so they'll just kind of crank back those gears and it's just multiple photos, one at the same time. And what they'll end up with is like a film reel. And so they can either have those kind of transpose on pieces of paper, like little post-it notes, and then put it all together. Or if we're talking about a movie house, they submit those, those giant film reels to the projectors of movie houses and they'll play it that way. Awesome, thank you. And I know you uh, you mentioned um, that when they uh, you know finally added sound just a moment ago, they called them talkies. Uh, yeah. One of my favorite, I can't believe this is a real thing, facts of all time, is that when you go to a movie, um, they're calling it a movie because it's a picture that moves. So we, we've just sort of yes. as that language, but a movie really is a moving picture um, that exactly. was kind of a cute word and that's just kind of stuck for forever. So that one's always stuck with me. Um, uh, back to, to Rosa, I know uh, one, a lot of people wanted to know um, with the Pisco app, a lot of people are saying, hey, I've got my 12 frames, I've got my 24. Is it possible to come up? Somebody mentioned a 40 minute animation. Someone said to make a full feature animation. Um, how far can Pisco take us? Well, you know what? That is a great question. I think it's up to them to figure out how long they have the patience to do it till. Um, you can certainly press the limits of a Pisco app. I haven't seen a limit just yet. And uh, we've gone up to 60. So, you know, it, you, I would say go ahead and test it, try it, and then let us know. I would love to know that. But you could always download and, and combine the, the different um, footages that you have. And, and that, I think the limiter really is time, right? It's sort of, you know, yeah. if you want to make all those, uh, you know, like they did in the Nickelodeon days, um, then you've got the time. And summer vacation started for uh, for so many of us right now. So those yeah. of you with the luxury of time, Absolutely. let's go for it. Let's, uh, let's exactly. see what we can put together. So, um, no, that's uh, that's great to hear. Another one, a few people added, you talked about the, uh, you know, the color wheel, complimentary colors and all those. Uh, one of my favorites, someone uh, wanted to know, hey, we know that secondary colors come from combined primary colors where do primary colors begin how do we how do we get those or how should we think about that oh that's great so primary colors are are pigments or tones that are self-existing so they're they're not they're either natural occurring or very pure so in order to get them that's a good question Alejandro do you know I don't know off the top no, of my head yeah, no, you're, you're going on the right track. So a lot of it is naturally occurring. I mean, you'll, you'll occasionally see like the secondary colors out of nature, uh, but for the most part, it, I, I think it actually came down to availability. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of uh, civilizations that did dyes, different types of colors to make fabrics and all that, uh, it was just very accessible to get those colors. So it just happened to be like the rule of law that these were the primary colors. In addition to that, I want to say that when it first came into print, it was much, much easier to print those primary colors. Those were very easy to do at that time, and which I think started in the late 1800s. Um, then when we slowly understood that combining those colors gave us some, some more color features or some more variations, then we were able to do, you know, um, we would do contrast, we would do shading, we would make things bolder. But then we started to get the cyans, the magentas, and then that opened the world for different color combinations that can be made to print or, you know, uh, 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 or utilized. 
Awesome. Thank you. And there are some cool history lessons involved in this one. You, you know, you, I, it hurts my soul as someone who grew up in the, you know, the 90s, you having to explain the floppy disk babe symbol. Uh, but we had some comments from parents and they're saying like, hey, the, you know, Pisco will animate things, but it actually looks a little bit like MS Paint and our, you know, our first, you know, yes. Microsoft Windows computers. And I think there's something to be said too for, um, you know, back then printers would have three colors for ink. And then they would mix them in any way that you could do it so that you could create all those new colors. And so there's something to be said for primary colors made it very easy with only a little bit of inventory of, of paint or ink to be able to make the entire rainbow happen. Correct. So you guys Correct. explained that one really, really well. Um, so with that, maybe time for uh, for one more question, actually two more, because I wanna talk a little bit about Liberty Science Center at large, but um, one other one is, um, also, oh, people were asking about, um, you showed us, um, you know, uh, vector images and mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, the, the um, you know, the pixel art, um, and most of the old video game images you showed us were in pixel. So uh, can you explain why, why would they have all been in pixel and not in vector? Oh, that's a great question. And it's all about technology. We did not have the capabilities. So in order for, um, for the, the, the computers at the time, in, in order for them to be coded, but also to be visual, at that time, we only had pixel as an end product. Um, so it didn't get sophisticated until computers started to improve. When computers started to improve, then we were able to have the power behind the computer to process the images very quickly and then get more information and get very detailed. So it, it really is about um, the capacity of the computing power at the time and then having that evolve so that then we can go into more detailed uh, um, graphics. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ed. It is amazing seeing the history come <laughs> through. Look, look how far we've come. I actually looked it up another day for some content for the um, the young animators camp there. There's uh, there are over a billion pixels on the new iPhones now. Yes. So everything you see is pixel art and vector art. It's just, ah, there's just that many more pixels now and they're that much smaller that you can't really see the That's boxes. That's exactly that right. It, like a really cool thing for kids to do if they find a newspaper, get a magnifying lens, take a look at the dot arrangement, like the black and white newspapers still use dots in order to get the images out. It's really crazy. Yeah, that's really amazing. So we've come a long way. You guys have all this power at your fingertips now. So please use it with the Pisco app. We want to see your drawings. Again, put that up on Instagram or yourself and you'll be entered to win a spot in a summer camp. And we just really want to see it. So tag both of us. I'll have that info up uh, you know, at the end. Last thing, summer vacation just started. We talk about all the power at people's fingertips and everything. For anyone passing through New Jersey, um, what should they know about Liberty Science Center? Uh, we've got a lot of people going up and down the East Coast with an opportunity to stop in. What can they see and, and uh, you know, how can they come visit you guys? Oh, absolutely. So we have so many things. So right now we have Minecraft exhibit. We will be, um, we will be getting Pompeii soon. Alejandro, I'm missing out on the, the next exhibition coming in. I know you can remind me. Oh, no, I think those are the two big ones, I believe. I, I, I forget. There is a transitional one, but those are like the big, big exhibits that we got. That yeah. coming up. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. The trains. The trains are coming, oh, people. The trains. The trains. Yes. It just dawned on me. Yes. <laughs> yes. So yeah, That's come true. to the Liberty Science Center. We're gonna have trains, no planes or automobiles, but trains are gonna definitely be there. And so I would imagine there's that. a parking lot. <laughs> You guys aren't out yes. far from Newark Airport. There's uh, everything you can imagine. What I love about Liberty Science Center is you guys have been with us. We've done kidney dissections and uh, yes. and uh, you know planetarium shows, all kinds of cool you know computer animation type things. Uh, so many exhibits and cool things to see at Liberty Science Center that even the people there can't remember them all. <laughs> so yes. many. You want to go visit this summer. So hey, thanks to you guys. I know you guys will be back with other cool exhibits that I can't quite remember right now uh, with things you'll be showing off uh, with Varsity Tutors all summer and, uh, and into the fall and everything. So huge thanks to, uh, to Rosa and Alejandro and everybody at Liberty Science Center for, uh, for putting this on. Thanks to all of you out there for amazing questions and interactivity, for sharing your drawings and, uh, and selfies with us. And uh, with that said, let me put up those instructions so you know exactly how to, uh, to share all that with us. We look forward to seeing all those up online soon and seeing all of you back here soon as well. So have a great weekend, everybody. Bye, everyone.